Our second scripture lesson comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, the 19th chapter. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. And a man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see Jesus because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome Jesus, and all who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. And then Jesus said to him, Today, Salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May I speak frankly? May I speak freely this morning? It is hard for me to be here today. Don't get me wrong, I was uh, very grateful to be asked to preach today by Pastor Patrice and the Facing Systemic Racism Committee. I'm very honored by this invitation, but to be honest with you, uh, my spirit has been weighed down a lot by uh, some other things recently. The past couple of months have been very difficult for me personally, marked by loss, the death of my best friend, as well as some frustrating health crises that I've been working through. Suffice it to say that I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to get up here and do this today. But over the past couple of weeks, the Lord has reminded me that I'm not alone in my grief. And I'm not the only one experiencing trouble and hardship in this season. That many of you are going through your own trials and tribulations. And I heard a lot of intense pain in the journey service earlier. That this congregation as a whole is in the midst of a turbulent season of change and transition. One that brings anxiety and, and nervousness around it. And indeed that your pastors themselves are dealing with fresh loss in their own lives. The Lord reminded me that I need to get out of myself and remember that we're all in this together. So before I go on, I just want to say to Pastor Patrice, Pastor Heather, if you're listening to you, all the saints of East Liberty Presbyterian Church, whatever you may be going through, just want to say that I love you, that I am with you, and that I share in your pain, so that one day, when the Lord has brought you through your storm, I might also share in your joy. But I also have something else to say today. I believe that the Lord has given me a word that I need to share. And that word has to do with the familiar story from the Gospel of Luke, the story that I just read about Jesus' encounter with a man named Zacchaeus. May I speak candidly? May I speak honestly? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think this is one of the most misunderstood and misread stories in all of the Gospels. I think no matter the, how many times we hear it, we still don't understand what it's really about. When I was growing up in the church, uh, my Sunday school lessons made a big deal about how Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Maybe you got those lessons too. Maybe you know that song by heart. And as a short guy myself, I resented that song, all right? I, it, just, it didn't rub me the right way. But though Zacchaeus is overcoming of his height deficiencies is cute fodder for children's sermons. I submit to you that it often distracts us from what is really going on in this episode. This isn't just a quaint story about a wee little man coming to faith. It's a lot more radical than that. 
When we're introduced to Zacchaeus, we're given two very critical pieces of information about him. The first is that he's a tax collector. Of course, tax collectors were agents of the Roman Empire. They were Jews who were vested with the authority to extract payment from their fellow Jews on behalf of Caesar Augustus. If that wasn't bad enough, tax collectors had earned a reputation for abusing their power to exploit the people and line their own pockets. They would demand more payment than what was required. They would intimidate the poor with threats and blackmail. And when things got escalated, when things got hot, when things got rough, they could always fall back on the sword of the state. The Roman military, the centurions and the town guard, the local law enforcement, the police always had their backs. And they would be ready and willing to use violence to help the tax collectors coerce and extort and remind the peasants of their place. Zacchaeus wasn't just a tax collector, he was the chief tax collector. So not only did he do these things himself, but he ordered others to do them for him. This is why he is so despised by his people. He's despised for his greed. He's despised for the methods that he uses, and he's above all despised for his betrayal of his own kinfolk. He sinned and continues to sin against his own brothers and sisters. And in doing so, he has ostracized himself. He has disassociated himself. He has severed himself from the family of Abraham, the covenant community of God. The second thing we're told about Zacchaeus is that he is rich. And that is not so much a statement about his financial status as it is a statement about his social status. You see, though Zacchaeus had distanced himself from the Jewish community, he found a home among a different class of people. He now counted himself among the elite. He rubbed shoulders with nobles and kings. He owned a fancy home in the nice part of town. He enjoyed the power and privilege afforded to him by the empire. Just a chapter before this story, Jesus tells another person, different situation, but he talks about how hard it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Indeed, it is virtually impossible. And it's not because wealth is evil. No, no, no. It's because wealth is often generated through violence and exploitation and subjugation. In order to be wealthy, one must be to some degree in solidarity with the oppressor, with the empire and its benefactor. You don't just get wealthy without that little catch. And you have to identify with the empire instead of the poor, instead of the marginalized, instead of the disinherited. And this is exactly what Zacchaeus has done. He has courted the favor of the empire for his own status, for his own comfort, at the expense of his own people. Zacchaeus is, the text says, lost. And he's lost because he identifies with the wrong crowd. But one day, as Jesus is passing through town, the Lord finds Zacchaeus in the crowd and invites himself over to his house, which ticks off some of the onlookers. Some of the people in the crowd grumble because it looks as though Jesus is condoning all of the abuse that they have endured over the years. But much to everyone's surprise, something else happens entirely. Zacchaeus, who is convicted by the Holy Spirit, resolves to do right by his fellow Jews. He tells Jesus, look, Lord, I will give half of my possessions to the poor. Half. Liquidating them and giving them away. What a radical commitment to redistribute his ill-gotten gain. But he goes further than that. I don't know if you caught this, but he says, if I have defrauded anyone, 
I will pay back four times as much. Four times! If Zacchaeus actually follows through on this promise, which by all indications he does, there goes his status as the elite. There goes his nice house. There goes his comfy lifestyle. There goes his membership at the local country club. There goes his children's inheritance. We need to appreciate what Zacchaeus is resolving to do here. He's determined not just to set things right. He's also determined to divest himself of the power and privilege of Caesar. He's determined to become poor. He's determined to sacrifice his uh, status and seek solidarity with the very people he has oppressed. He is determined to leave his current life behind and reclaim his sacred calling. And for this, Jesus says, today, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. He too is a part of this family. Zacchaeus has started the process of being rejoined to the covenant community apart from which there is no salvation. The lost son has come home. The lost sheep has been brought back into the fold. The lost sinner has been reunited with his family. And the angels in heaven are partying together. Okay, see, this isn't just a story about how one man had a conversion experience. And this isn't just a story about reparations. Okay, this is a story about God's salvation through communal reparation. This is a story about a body that has been broken and fractured by greed and injustice being reconstructed by repentance and grace. That's how salvation works. That's how the lost become found. May I speak boldly? May I speak fearlessly today? I think the white church is lost. And no, before you get me misunderstood, I'm not talking about the fundamentalists. I'm not talking about conservative evangelicals. I'm not talking about the people who wear red baseball caps and QAnon shirts and run up into people's houses with hammers. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about us. I'm talking about how our house is broken. Sure, our doctrine might be sound. Our polity is on point. Our intentions are mostly in the right place. But despite all of that, we have yet to be saved. This is, there is a profound, profound excuse me, division in our family of faith. And again, I'm not talking primarily about political or theological or even ideological differences, though those do exist. I'm talking about how our predominantly white denomination And white Presbyterians especially continue to identify with the power and privilege of the American empire instead of and at the expense of their non-white brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm talking about how we have designed our ministries to cope with, to deal with the demonic powers of systemic and structural racism instead of casting it out in Jesus' name. I'm talking about how we have just grown so accustomed to this is just how it will always be. Instead of looking for ways to change our situation. I'm talking about how we can sit in a service and sing, we shall overcome. And then go back to our segregated lives and somehow fail to see the hypocrisy in it all. I'm talking about how people of color on staff at our churches, possibly even this one, aren't always given the same dignity, respect, and pay as their white counterparts. I'm talking about how almost all of our black Presbyterian churches in this city are under-resourced in their community struggles against the existential threat of a racist society. Meanwhile, we've got some very rich churches in our presbytery sitting on massive endowments. And even though a lot of that wealth was enabled by centuries of systemic oppression and centuries of inequality and centuries of exploitation and centuries of slavery. 
And even though black people have been excluded from that pie, very few of those dollars, if any, are earmarked for righting historical wrong. By the way, I know where I'm at. I heard the children's sermon. I heard how Sister Sarah asked the kids, what do we have more than we need? What can we give to those so that they may know that they are loved and cared for? I can think about a few things, a few ways that we can give back and make things right. Family, I'm talking about how for far too long we have settled for being informed by a vision for racial reconciliation instead of transformed by it. I'm talking about how for far too long we have had to justify how our anti-racist work fits into our theology instead of asking how our theology measures, measures up to the commands of Jesus. I'm talking about how for far too long we have failed to do what needs to be done in order to seek justice and repair for our communion. And what is that? What needs to be done? What, what do we need to do? <clears throat> well, if anything, it involves white Christians and white churches divesting themselves of their privilege as much as possible, even if that means sacrificing their wealth and their status. It means white Christians and white churches centering the concerns and needs of people of color and all oppressed peoples for that matter, even if that means changing, out who, changing who they hang out with. It means white Christians and white churches having the courage to call out white supremacy wherever and whenever they see it, not just on the news, but in their own neighborhoods. It means white Christians and white churches risking comfort and safety to stand with the oppressed and say to their siblings of color when tragedy strikes, when hardship strikes, I love you, I am with you, I share in your pain. So that you might share, so that I might share in your joy. By the way, um, there is a word in here for our uh, black brothers and sisters as well. I don't mean to just be talking to one side of the family. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's, you know, there's a word for us too, just as there was a word for those grumbling crowds in Jericho, right? Community reconstruction, like what I'm talking about and what I'm advocating for, it involves courage and compassion on our part as well. It involves the willingness to forgive and love and disciple the very people who have defrauded you and ignored you and devalued you. It's hard. It's hard work. But I believe that the Spirit can empower us to do that too. But you see, I, I talk to that side of the family every Sunday. <laughs> uh, I, get to, I, don't, I don't get to speak to a lot of white people a lot anymore. So uh, this, this is my chance. And the fact of the matter is, that just as the Jewish community cannot receive Zacchaeus until he repents, our white siblings need to make the first move. If they want to be saved, if we as a church want salvation, we will need to move toward one another in friendship, humility, and faith. May I speak openly? May I speak truthfully? Thank you. It would have been real awkward if you said no there. So, listen, I think, I think we have great reason to be hopeful. Because the good news today is that the Savior has invited himself into our house. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And just as Jesus saw Zacchaeus through the crowd and called him to a new way of life, Jesus sees us. And he is calling us into a deeper life of faithfulness. I promise you, I didn't come here to bash ELPC. Okay? Quite the contrary, actually. Um, I am very grateful and I rejoice in the ministry of this church. I grew up right down the street in Stanton Heights. In fact, I still live there and I can see the steeple from my office, from my house. It's really cool. I've also seen much of the wonderful kingdom work you have done together over the years. You've done so well to build a multicultural communion, to establish yourself as a voice for justice and equality in our city, to steward your resources in the right direction. If there is any congregation positioned to lead this presbytery into the vision that Christ has for us, it is this one, it is you. 
So I didn't come to guilt or condemn or devalue your work this far. Rather, I came to encourage you to go deeper. After all, what's the point of having a multicultural church if it doesn't bleed into your relationships outside these walls? What's the point of having a Reparation Sunday service if it doesn't change who you are? What's the point of having all of this wealth and this beautiful structure and all these assets and this property if you're not willing to use it to change things? to make things right. Last year, uh, I understand your session moved to make the Facing Systemic Racism uh, Committee. It used to be a task force, but now it's become a standing committee of your church. You're making it an explicit part of who you are. That's a great start. That's an excellent start. And I've, I mean, it just, just the journey service and uh, Dr. Baylor's talk, there's stuff going on around here and in this community that gives me just, just, just evidences of the Spirit's movement in the right direction. So I urge all of us here and online, I urge all of you to heed the conviction of the Spirit and continue to seek reparation within our church, within ELPC and the Presbytery at large to repent of our idolatry, to comfort and status and power. Because if you're chasing those things, you're not chasing Jesus. To tangibly identify with the least of these, not just with our words, but with our actions. Not just with our intentions, but with our wealth. Not just with our tweets and our Facebook posts, but with our buildings and our bodies. And we got to start with our brothers and sisters in Christ. May we find one another again. May we come home and recognize that we are all an integral part of this covenant community of God. And when we do that, a party will break out among the angels and saints in heaven. For today, salvation has come to our house. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.